It is Sunday morning, so I'm working on the first pre-trip diary week one um, journal entry. One thing God has been teaching me this week is that I cannot save a single soul. My witness of the gospel is not going to be perfect and not everyone's going to accept the message. I was listening to like a talk slash sermon from an evangelist to Mormons and he was saying God only uses sinners to witness and so I don't have to feel so horrible about some of the mistakes I make because we, we're still fallen creatures and we have our limitations but God is still good and he will bring it all to fruition. Like a wild ex-members? Oh here it is. In Passport to Heaven he talks about how Pastor Benson I believe, the Baptist minister who shared the gospel with him, the minister felt like he had failed in his um, like gospel presentation, I guess he felt like the meeting was in vain. He never knew that the seed he planted, or the seed God planted through him, ended up bringing Micah Wilder to saving faith. So, again, we just have to faithfully preach the gospel and God will do the growing. I also realized that God has to be the one who opens their eyes. They're not going to receive the gospel unless the Holy Spirit has, I guess, like prompt and call them. It takes a lot of pressure off my back. That's one of the other talks that I listened to that we're just here to proclaim the good news and then we just entrust it to God because it's Him who saves. We are just vessels, instruments that He uses. And of course, we're weak. God knows that we are but dust. And so He works even through our weakness for His glory. And that there's a lot of peace in knowing that. Because I did get to preach the gospel several times this week to different people, including the missionaries. And I have things that I regret about each approach. And everything's a learning experience and I hope not to make those same mistakes moving forward but again I have to trust that even if I was weak in that moment God will still use that hopefully to bring these people to faith beautiful Florida weather It tells women or wives to submit to their husbands. You submit to your teachers, you submit to your parents. You, Whenever you have someone above you, you submit to them. It doesn't mean you're any lesser than them. It's just your role. It's your position. But then husbands are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That means he has to be willing to die for her. What about families that have, like, I don't know, a woman is like a police officer and a man is like a little stay-at-home dad. That doesn't mean she can't submit to him. That's just her job and his job. Normally, it would be the other way around, but in the case where she's a police officer and he's the stay-at-home guy, it doesn't matter. She, her role as a wife is still to submit. At, at her work, she'll probably have other people submitting to her, right? And, but she'll have to submit to a greater chief officer or whoever's on top of her. But in the family, in the home, her role is now to submit to her husband. Wives and husbands are supposed to have discussions and be like, oh, I don't think that's the best course of action. But ultimately, the final say would be the husband. Whoever makes the difficult decisions, the responsibility is on them to face the consequences of it if it goes bad. They're the ones who make those difficult decisions and then they face the consequences and protect their family and shield them from those consequences if it goes bad. You're at school. Your teacher is over you. You submit to her. It's called hierarchy. There's always going to be hierarchy. No one's going to have the same exact authority. We all have the same exact dignity and value, 
We're all human beings created in God's image and he values all of us. It's just about authority. The whole reason we have a government is because there's people on top who are supposed to protect the ones at the bottom. Whoever has more power has more responsibility to care for and protect the ones underneath them. So the father, he's supposed to be the head of the household. He's supposed to protect for you guys, provide for you guys. And then you guys give him that respect. The authority structure is there for a reason. She told me that the translation of the Bible has led to it losing a lot of its core doctrines. I said, do you know how Bible translations work? Like the modern English translations we have today are based off of the earliest Greek trans uh, manuscripts that we have. It's not like it went from Greek to like Italian to Chinese to like Egyptian and then back to English. No, we go straight to the source. The Book of Mormon, on the other hand, doesn't have any manuscripts and we don't have the gold plates either. We don't have the reformed Egyptian, but she believes it was translated perfectly because it was translated by the power of God. And so I told her, Joseph Smith said that he took a stone, put in a hat and stuck his face in a hat and words would appear on the stone one by one. And unless they wrote down the word perfectly, the next word wouldn't show up. So why is it then, if the Book of Mormon was written perfectly, why did it have so many changes made to it after it was published? And she's like, oh, those are just minor changes. They're not any doctrinal changes. So they're like, oh, language changes, you know? So in order to clarify it, to make it un more understandable to us in modern days, they have to change the word. And then I said, okay, but for the Bible, when they make these changes, you say that everything goes missing for some reason. But for the Book of Mormon, when they actually take out certain words and replace them, it's only supposed to clarify the original meaning. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. I'm also surprised that they didn't shy away from the belief that they, uh, the Mormon belief that God was once a man and that they'll become gods. A lot of Mormons are like, we don't believe that, but they are like, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about God that's still a mystery, but he is literally our heavenly father, like literally our father, like literally. She said that whenever the Bible says we're children of God, it's literal. And then when I said that, the Bible also says that we're children of wrath. And whenever it talks about us being children of God, it's in reference to God being our creator. And she said, no, we're not, he's not just our creator. We're not just his creation. We, we are literally his children. But then when it talks about children of wrath and then becoming children of God through Christ, she's like, well, that's like more like spiritual and it shows how like our fallen nature, we are children of not there, but then we get the privilege of becoming children of Christ. So you get to choose when the children of God references are literal, and then you get to choose when it's not literal. And she's like, see, that's why we need a Mormon prophet today who can tell us how to interpret these things. It's like, we're just trying our best. We don't believe that we have to be perfect because it's impossible to be perfect. I'm like, actually your prophet Spencer W. Kimball said, trying is not good enough. You have to be perfect and it's possible. And she's like, she didn't know what to say. Cause I would call you her own prophet. I pray, I pray for her, I pray that she will come to understand the gospel of grace. I also gave them like these Bible study books on the book of Galatians, which is all about grace, not works, the pure gospel of grace. I gave that to them and I left a note saying like, my sincerest prayers for them to know the sufficiency of Christ and rest in his finished work.